G'day everyone. Hello. I'm Ryan. And I'm Jen. And we are here today to present uh, all things dog training in light of our newly released book titled How to Train Your Dog. So before we get started, we thought we'd do a little bit of an introduction about who are we and our animal training journey and why we might be able to help you with your dogs or your neighbor's dogs or uh, dogs in general. So uh, I started training animals when I was about 10 or 11 years old with birds actually so uh, that was my first passion was working with birds and then led to fish I then became a marine biologist and worked at Taronga Zoo training marine mammals and all different aquatic creatures and throughout that journey I was dabbling with dog training entering into uh, agility and obedience trials and uh, as time went on my love for all things marine started to be overtaken by dogs and uh, during that journey I met Jen and uh, we started our own dog training business and um, yeah over to you that kind of led us <laughs> to where we are now. Yeah well I, I started helping out in vets um, I obviously knew early on that I wanted to do something with animals that also led me to uh, work at Toronto Zoo and some other zoos in Sydney uh, meet Brian and then then we started our dog training career and passion from there, yep. together. So for probably the last uh, six years, all we've done virtually exclusively tra is train dogs. We still do our zoo consults and work with aquariums for short and specific projects around maybe particular animals learning particular tasks. But we have at our home now, we have uh, seven dogs here at the moment that are all in some way, shape or form working dogs in the sense that Finn, our little Shetland sheepdog, he helps reactive and aggressive dogs overcome their fear of dogs. And he also works in what we call the Sinophobia Clinic, which is a clinic for people who have fear of dogs. And uh, Finn also works with our Belgian Malinois, Rafa, who's on the cover of the book, this handsome stud right here, uh, in the Sinophobia Clinic. Rafa's a very large, imposing, dark face, typical sort of scary looking dog. And Rafa's also a biosecurity dog. And the rest of our dogs, all different beautiful, wonderful uh, Springer and Cocker Spaniels all work in working roles as either biosecurity or what we would call conservation dogs. So dogs that are finding animals and plants that are either really worth conserving, that might be critically endangered or a threatened species. And then on the flip side of that, also finding new incursions into our country of plants that shouldn't be here or maybe animals that are getting onto islands or different parts of the country that we don't want them, such as cane toads, rats, mice, and other <laughs> invasives as well. So all of our dogs are very much part of the family, but like us, uh, they work and we all get to work together almost every day, which is lovely. Yeah, I think um, the coolest thing about working with dogs and about our, our business since we've branched away from the zoo is that we have managed to diverse a dog training business into so many different facets from the Sinophobia Clinic to conservation and biosecurity dogs like Ryan was mentioning to pet dog work, film and television. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure there's more yeah. and I can't think of it. Um, so they really are the most incredible animal to work with and every single dog that we work with, whether it's, um, a, whether it's our dogs or a, a consultation that we go to, we learn new things every single time. Um, we've got a lot of stories about the dogs we've worked with in our book. Yep. Um, and I think they've grown us as dog trainers over the years to be uh, the trainers we are today. Yeah. And one thing <laughs> and have that, the knowledge that we do today. One thing that we do with our dogs that we really learned through the zoo industry, which has inspired the book, is to treat them all as individuals and do the best thing you can do is to try and work out what makes your dog tick, understand their genetics, yeah. understand their ailments, their physical abilities and what they really like and what really motivates them. And that's what we always did with every animal we worked with at the zoo and something that we really try and uh, encourage and inspire people to do through the book is figure out ways to really work out what makes their dog tick and what is going to bring them to being a happy dog. So today, the, you know, the overarching theme of our 
presentation is going to be about how do you make your dog happy a happy dog fulfilled. is easy to live with it's yep. fulfilled it is you know not just obedient but willing and wanting to do what it can to work with you and be happy as being compliant around the house or on the street or off lead and we're going to show you a little um slide in a moment that we call the happy dog pyramid and we base everything more or less uh starting at the bottom the the heaviest weight of what is going to impact your dog's ability to be happy is their genetics and health now everything else on this <laughs> list depending on your dog and your household and your lifestyle they are they are transferable so you don't necessarily need to take this as literal or as verbatim but genetics and health will absolutely underpin everything you cannot train or you shouldn't really be training a dog that is unwell so we always say to people if you're having a problem with your dog if you suspect something is making your dog aggressive or anxious or upset we do like you to first and foremost go and see your vet make sure that your dog doesn't have teeth issues joint issues breathing difficulties especially if that that sudden changing that behavior yeah. change is sudden and not over a period of time yeah so we very much like to work in conjunction with vets we've got a lot of clinics uh, around new south wales that we work very closely with and um yeah you know we, we pay tribute to a lot of the vets that will um really beautifully be able to fix something that creates an underlying behavioral issue yep so this <coughs> Sorry, this pyramid here, whether you've tuned in because you're about to get a new puppy or you, you've got your new, newest family member or you have an old, older dog with a behavioural issue, this pyramid is a great basis for all of the above. So for setting your puppy up for success long term in, in their behaviour or if you have a dog that has all of a sudden, um, you know, has a behavioural issue that is undesirable and you're trying to fix, then go back to this these steps and stages to try to reach that happy dog goal yep. down the end. So what we're going to do over the next uh, hour is sort of go through these stages and explain what they're about and how to implement them uh, generally yep. uh, to cover hopefully most of um, to help most of the people who have tuned in. If you have a question at any stage, send it through and we'll answer it as we go. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about <laughs> genetics, there's a couple of different ways that we would like you to consider the genetics of your dog. So first and foremost, we want you to be aware that there are different dog groups. So there's registered, there's seven different registered dog groups in Australia. And uh, there we go. And um, there is obviously lots of crossbreeds and um, popular, you know, oodle varieties and common breeds that will cross over. But these different registered <laughs> dog groups in Australia, which you know have about 400 breeds within them, were mostly originally bred for a, a physical purpose. So whether it be something like the Cavalier Spaniel that was bred to be on the laps of royalty and keep them warm, or whether it be a dog like a Mastiff <laughs> or a Shepherd that, you know, primary function was to form some type of guarding instinct, they all have physical abilities and emotional and behavioral traits that they were bred for for literally hundreds and hundreds of years so in the case of the spaniels that you can see i'm um, running through the bushfires there or up sally with her tennis ball spaniels have been bred for 700 years to find things with their nose to find things that aren't moving around not track them but actually find them through the air which is why we use them for detection work and understanding what makes that breed what it is, particularly from a behavioural perspective, will really give you a great idea of to what things you can expect the dog to be triggered by, what makes the dog happy, what makes it feel fulfilled and good and warm inside. And you can tailor your training uh, to suit that dog as an individual. Now, we acknowledge that there's going to be lots of crossbreeds and variations, <laughs> and you might get a dog from the pound, you might have a a few spare bucks to do a genetic test, you might find out that the dog has seven different breeds from all different groups <laughs> within it. And you can just utilize that to, to just give yourself, all right, well, I could be expecting anything here. Or 
you might get a dog that is predominantly terrier. Now, the terrier variety of dogs we know to be generally very wanting to bond to people. They want to be around people a lot. And if they don't have that time and that ability to be part of the family, terriers more than any other dog will really fret and will get really anxious. Now, on the flip side of that, terriers, the name is terrier meaning the earth, they have a high desire to hunt vermin through the earth. So if you're anywhere in Australia at the moment where we're experiencing a mouse or a rat plague, your dog with a bit of terrier in it is going to be having the best time of its life <laughs> chasing rats around. If you get a, a dog and you find out that it's a terrier and you have guinea pigs in your backyard or chooks perhaps, maybe not so much chooks as much as say <laughs> small moving mammals, but terriers have a high desire to chase small moving animals Very on the ground. Very instinctual. Very instinctive, absolutely. Yeah. It's not something they need to be trained to do. They just want to do it. It's not being a bad dog. It's not aggressive or anything like that. That's they're just working off their genetics. And as long as you know that, hey, I've got a terrier, it needs a lot of time connecting with the family and it has a high desire to chase and grab things that moves through the ground, you can play games with toys and tennis balls and flirt poles that simulate that and make that dog feel good for doing that instead of, um, you know, rousing on them every time they want to chase a possum. And that is what we'll talk about in the outlet section of the pyramid further up. Um, and this is why understanding this side of it, the genetics, will help you then determine that outlet yeah. section a little bit more. You've got the working dogs too, and I reckon 90% of the behavioural behavioral consultations that we visit with a working dog breed, we're dealing with reactive behaviours or tendencies to um, moving objects. Cars, so for those of you that don't know what reactive is as well, it's a very common used term within our industry, but it's just not necessarily aggressive. It's just a dog that when it sees a particular stimulus, it's barking, it's lunging, it's hitting the end of the lead. And it's usually deemed as something undesirable, but a, a good working dog, a good Kelpie, a good Border Collie mm. as a young dog, when it sees moving objects, it should lunge, it should yeah. bark and it should go to chase certain things not everything yeah. and we just need to teach them hey we don't want you to lunge and round up and chase cars and bikes but you can do that with maybe sheep or yeah. cattle or tennis <laughs> balls or um any variety of toys so you've got that slide in front of you you can see the seven different dog groups if you have your own dog google it they are called the a and kc dog groups and you can learn more about them and uh there's huge descriptions within our book of those different dog groups and exercises that are going to make that dog feel really good. So start there. Make sure your dog is physically healthy, understand its genetics, and you are already really having the foundations to making a happy, obedient dog. <coughs> Going on to safety, cool. safety management. Yeah. Yep, safety and management. Uh, this, this is... I think this is huge, yes. this particular section. I think when anyone, especially I, I deal more with puppy development, uh, puppy schools, et cetera, and people um, who need help raising uh, the puppy from the beginning. Um, and management is huge in preventing undesirable behaviour from, uh, from coming out of the woodworks. So we will do everything in our house prior to bringing a puppy home to set them up for success. So, uh, you know, in puppy school, I hear questions all the time about how do I stop my dog doing X, Y, Z? How do I, how do I make my dog not do this? Or how do I fix this problem? And it's, probably the most annoying thing is to say prevent it from happening <laughs> um, but that means through things like puppy pens and um, mm -hmm. and leads and all that all the above we actually uh, our last puppy that we raised we built it probably cost us about four hundred dollars but we built a contained area on the end of our deck uh, that allowed our puppy the space to be outside, to be with us, but they couldn't be chasing the kids around the garden. Um, she well, couldn't, yeah. all the chooks, she couldn't go over to the fence line where there were other two Labradors and practice running and barking up and down the fence line. Uh, so yeah, management has a really big part. And obviously we wanna keep our puppies and older dogs safe, first yeah. and foremost. When, whenever we bring a new dog home, we assume but that dog isn't bonded with us yet and it might have a high desire to escape from the property. So as well as setting up the area um, to prevent the dog from say chasing other animals and children, we also wanna make sure that that dog is less likely to escape from our property. 
once a new dog escapes and runs off away from your property, uh, you can have a really difficult time in getting that dog back because it's not bonded with you. And you can also potentially have the dog learn a, you know, a repertoire or a behavior that they will practice later on in life when they're stressed. So the way our property is set up most of the time, most of the dogs could escape if they wanted to. These are all highly agile working dogs uh, who at work will regularly have to jump over things that are six foot high or onto things six foot high, maybe with a bit of help or something to spring off. But yet our fences are only, you know, 100, 120 centimetres high and they don't escape. And that's because they are fulfilled, but we also have areas like the, the deck and like another a dog run that we have where when the dogs are just getting used to the property, there's no physical way they can escape. We will not let that happen. They'll either be under supervision, they'll be on lead, or they'll be in an area where escape isn't possible until that dog feels good, feels safe, likes the other dogs here, likes us, knows how to come when they're called, and then we can say, right, you've got more freedom. We know that you'll be safe in our yard now because you're a content dog. The other thing about that, I think, too, is making sure they're contained and they're safe. Uh, is that when you bring home a puppy for the first time or potentially a rescue, an older dog that's a rescue, um, we as human beings feel the need to want to give them everything and, and all this space. But for that dog, that vulnerable dog that's come home into a new environment, it's actually far more uh, beneficial for the, their emotional development to be contained to a smaller area and get used to that area and feel confident in that area before giving them access to an enormous backyard or, or taking a rescue dog within the first few weeks to a dog park. Um, so that, that need for freedom for the dog's perspective yeah. isn't necessarily the best thing for them. Now, the bottom of this pyramid, the safety and management and the next step up socialization, environmental conditioning, uh, is all of, is is the imp most is more important I think <laughs> it all works together, um, but it's it's really important in helping the dog's emotional state first is raising that dog that is resilient it it feels confident it's uh, what's the other one it, independence yeah. and independence comes into safety and management too is we're trying to uh, it, things like crate training and puppy pens to slowly build our dog's resilience to being left alone long-term in the backyard by themselves down the track. Yeah. So the other thing is uh, in that management section, when you are looking at um, where your dog is kept when they're not supervised, uh, one of the things <laughs> I really, really want everyone to keep in mind, particularly for those of you that have dogs that uh, displaying some form of aggressive or super undesirable behaviour is when you leave them alone, they cannot be in a location where they can see their triggers and see the things that set them off. The worst thing you can do for an anxious or aggressive dog or a dog that is just generally what we would say reactive. Or a vulnerable puppy. Or a vulnerable puppy, yeah. The, the worst thing you can do is leave them in a pen where they are frequently seeing things like dogs and people and cars going past them and that is making them either scared or making them bark or making them chase. If I'm the best dog trainer in the world and I'm gonna fix your dog from chasing people or cars or dogs, I cannot <laughs> fix a dog by being there and training it for an hour or two or three or four hours a day, one on one, if they're allowed to practice that behavior when they're unsupervised. So for any of you, if your dog is doing something undesirable, go out to Bunnings or Mitre 10 or your local hardware store and get some shade cloth or get some new fencing and separate sections of your yard or maybe consider bring them inside mm. more often. A lot of dogs are heaps calmer if they're actually allowed into the house and you'd be surprised how long a mature male dog will go holding its bladder if it's allowed inside the house. So consider it how you manage them and where you leave them when they're unsupervised as probably the most effective and important part of training your dog to not chase, not bark, not be anxious, um, instead of going, well, how can I get a trainer around here to stop that? Let's prevent that before we talk about stopping that behaviour or training them something else. Yeah. So uh, we're not going to go into it, but uh, we are massive advocates for crate training. Um, it will take us forever to go through why, but the book really explains it. So if you have any hesitations at all, it's worth reading the book and understanding all the 
all the benefits and all the right ways to do it. Obviously, there's wrong ways to create training yep. as well. Sure. Um, and yeah, that is a, a big part of the building block later on. We see a lot of older dogs that have behavioral issues that we then have to look at potentially crate training to help help them down the track it's a lot harder with an older dog yeah all right cool. so uh moving on to socialization and environmental conditioning now before we go any further we really need to stress that socialization is appropriately socializing or exposing your dog to other living creatures it isn't just about socializing your dog with dogs and mm. The emphasis, I should say, is on appropriately socialising. It is not appropriate to take a puppy to an off-lead dog park. Full stop, period, ever. No one will ever change my mind on that. There is a whole host of reasons why it is not appropriate to take a puppy to an off-lead dog park. Number one, for those of you in North Queensland or Western New South Wales, there is a genuine risk of diseases such as parvovirus and distemper that puppies aren't fully vaccinated against. But following that, the number one killer of dogs in Australia is dogs being put down due to behavioural reasons. Behavioural problems can be developed, or almost always are developed, during the first 16 weeks of your dog's life, and usually because of uh, unpleasant or inappropriate experiences. So a eight to 16 week old puppy that goes to a dog park and either practices chasing dogs a lot, or getting chased by dogs and harassed by dogs a lot will almost certainly, I guarantee you, will be a problem adult dog. You won't see the problems for the next six or even 12 months, but when that dog matures, a, a puppy that has been at a busy dog park every day will almost certainly obsess over dogs in a positive way. Or become, yeah. be, but that makes the dog very difficult to recall and be bonded with the owner or become fearful of dogs and then become aggressive. So socialization needs to be done with the idea of my puppy needs to see dogs and smell dogs and hear dogs, but it doesn't need to play with them. There's no, in socialization, particularly with breeds that have Labrador. a very high desire to socialize or herd or predate most breeds, right? They really don't need to practice high arousal, rumbling and playing with other dogs. With unknown dogs. Yeah, with I think unknown it's, dogs. Yeah, yeah, it's for important sure. for yeah. all dogs to have their known doggy friends. But when you're raising a puppy from a young age, you want you and your family to be the most socially exciting and important thing in their world. They are social beings, yes, but they don't need that play to come always from other dogs, especially unknown dogs. Yeah. So choose a couple of known doggy friends and slowly in integrate them together through on lead walks, through maybe a play date in your back garden. And when you do do those play dates, we talk about doing the cafe dog exercise as well. So this means, um, and this comes under management in our book as well, uh, but this means letting them have a little bit of a play, but then also teaching your puppy a very important lesson of being able to relax and be calm in the presence of other dogs as well. Yeah, for sure. And that uh, idea of being calm in the presence of other dogs will not occur if every time your puppy sees a dog, you allow them to play together. Yeah. So the best thing you can do for your puppy or even your adult dog that you've just acquired is usually you teach them that we don't need to meet every dog. No. You can walk past them. It can be a positive experience without meeting the dog. You can, every time your dog looks at another dog, you can say, good boy, now let's heal and keep walking. And your dog can still go, well, that was nice. I got told I'm a good dog, but we also moved on and we didn't meet the other dog. That's right. We have a 10 week old puppy at the moment that we're raising. And every day we're going out, actually, this brings me to the next point is we, we also live in an area where there has been active cases of parvovirus, but this will not stop us from taking our puppy off our property because it's so important, especially if you live in a built up town or city like Sydney or Brisbane or where are we Cairns. Um, and if we keep our puppy for the entire critical period, which unfortunately is the entire length until that dog is fully vaccinated if we keep them home in our lounge room that whole time their brain is absorbing the lounge room as comfortable as familiar and as their world so when it comes to 16 weeks if you clip a lead on that puppy and take them for a walk along the promenade you're going to have a very very nervous puppy on your hands that spent that whole time in their lounge room so as, like ryan said at the beginning socialization isn't about one-on-one -on -one dog uh, 
dog to dog socialization experiences. It's about getting them out and getting them exposed to everything. You're going to expect that puppy to cope with and be happy around as an adult. Yeah. And one of the topics or ways that we describe socialization and environmental conditioning is we want our dogs to view most things in their world as neutral. Okay. So for, I'll give you some examples of environmental conditioning is talking about the environment around the dogs and mechanical things and, and structures. I want all of my dogs to view, this is my working dogs, for example, I want them to view cars, motorbikes, people, other dogs and birds, chickens, forklifts <laughs> as neutral. It's not scary. It's not nice. It's just neutral. It's like furniture in our house. It's not something that we particularly have a high attachment to, but it can exist in our environment just as something that is present. That's right. But what I want to be positive is me. I want the dog to think I'm fantastic. So when we're in that neutral environment, if I ask them to come, to sit, to find, or to do a behavior, I'm comparatively the most positive thing in that environment. And then I can use my food treats, I can use tennis balls, I can use toys that I've also made very positive for my dogs to work on other things, all right? So when you're looking at raising your dog or training your dog, think of what does neutral mean? Is my dog a bit scared of the lawnmower or is my dog obsessed with the lawnmower and chasing it around? How do I bring it back to being more neutral? So, you know, if the dog loves chasing the lawnmower, you might want to start tying the dog up while you mow the lawn and mow the lawn at a distance. If your dog is fearful of it, you might want to introduce the dog to the lawnmower while it's off and give it some treats. And we try and work that pendulum till we get our dog back to a neutral state of going, well, the lawnmower is just okay. I'd rather be chasing a ball or chewing on a bone while you mow the lawns anyway. Yeah. So view it as um, environmental conditioning and socialization, just making your dog very comfortable with the world around them. And then you can have a dog that you can make swimming positive, running with you super positive, playing fetch, uh, training and just being engaged with their owner as more positive. And everything else in the world is just neutral. It's yeah. nice. Yeah, that's why the next two parts, the, the training and the outlets are really important. What we're trying to do now is get our puppy feeling comfortable and confident with everything in life. So nothing is scary or overwhelming. And then once we've got that confident dog, they are so easy and so willing to train. And then we want to make them think that we are the world. Yeah. If we're doing a dog's day out presentation and we bring our dogs along, um, we've got to make sure that they, they want to work with us. They don't want to go and say hello to every other person or steal the dog's bone over there or chase after the dogs over there. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a period uh, in the early days of really making the dogs feel comfortable yeah. and, and building resilience. There's going to be times where you're taking your older dog out or your puppy and they find or see something that is scary um, and how you deal with that scary moment will help that dog become uh, build resilience rather than build a fear towards it as well. Yeah. Now, one of the things that um, happens, you know, we'd like to have happen during our any of our dogs' lives, but particularly early on, is that they get exposed to a thunderstorm. Now, Jen and I, well, Jen in particular, will usually think of these topics as for puppies and young dogs, but this does apply to adult dogs and older dogs as well. It's just that what you do with a puppy has the capacity to, to prevent or, or even create lifelong issues. Whereas if you only start tackling things like thunderstorms with a dog as an adult, um, it, it can slip back into old habits. So let's say if I have a puppy and it's, well, I do have a puppy and she's 10 weeks old, we're, we're going to get some wild weather this afternoon. I know for a fact that uh, her line of dogs, her lineage of dogs can be a little bit sensitive to storms. They're not full-blown storm phobic, but they can get a bit sensitive. They can be sooky, not want to work or seek out human companionship whenever there's wild weather. So with this puppy, when the storm kicks off either this afternoon or tomorrow morning, I'll probably take her outside and play fetch and play a bit of tug with her because I know that's her favourite things to do. And what I'm doing is I'm making the storm a bit positive. I'm making storms fun 
by association with the games that I'm playing. Now, if she freaks out during the storm when we get a big, a big clap of thunder and she runs to me for a bit of, you know, support, I'll give her support, okay? I'm not going to be hard on the dog. I'm not going to say, oh, you know, harden up and deal with it. I will give the dog a little bit of support, but it'll be lighthearted. It'll be loose. Oh, it's okay. I'll talk to the dog. I'll say to the dog what I would feel and let the dog realize that, well, it's okay to come and get a cuddle during the storm, but it's, it's not a big deal. It's not something we worry about. So the other things that people do during storms or during any sort of event that might make dogs fearful, like fireworks, is they either ignore the dog completely when the dog needs some encouragement, or they go overboard. And this is a thing that gives encouragement a bad name or gives reassurance a bad name where a lot of dog trainers will say, no, nah, don't give, well, I shouldn't say a lot of dog trainers, but some dog trainers will say, no, don't give the dog any affection or encouragement when they're scared because you'll reinforce the fear. That's only if you encourage them like a baby. So for example, if I have a dog that's scared of a thunderstorm and I go, oh, it's okay, it's okay. And I get down low on the ground and I'm talking in a manner and behaving in a manner that is akin to me being scared. I'm confirming to the dog, I'm also scared. So you should be scared. And then we have this feedback loop of emotional contagion where the dog is getting more scared as we're pretending to be scared during a thunderstorm. <laughs> What we should do is be confident and be happy with the dog. I so think it's in the middle. It's I see it with my my kids if they fall over and hurt their knee. Um, how I respond to that situation can determine their ongoing emotional state. Yeah. So if I just completely ignore, they get more upset. Uh, if I go, oh my gosh, you hurt your knee, that must hurt so much and carry on like crazy, then they're going to get more upset. But if I actually go, are you okay? Give me a cuddle. Let's put a bandaid on it, you know, and keep it calm and uh, reassure them. You end up with a kid that a minute later is like, cool, I've got a cool bandaid on my leg. I'm fine now. Yeah, so a, yes, it is. Um, they are, they are, you're dealing with socially intelligent, emotional creatures that really need that, that, that emotional support early on in the relationship to, to create that stable dog down the track. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else in socialization? No, it's, environment? it's a topic we could probably talk on for know. an hour, but um, I it's guess- a middle ground, there's a balance. We talk about it as a seesaw in the book. You know, yeah. you can go way to one end or you could go way too much down the other end and not take your puppy out at all or, or your older dog. But if you can kind of get it in the middle a little bit and make things neutral and maybe a little bit boring and they don't care about it, then you're you're winning. Yeah, and um, a- the next step up is obedience, but uh, as most dog trainers will tell you, it's very difficult to make a dog obedient if it is either scared yep. or obsessive over the things that are around them. So that's why socialization and environmental conditioning um, as an underpinning topic, which can be done in conjunction with obedience, but that whole concept uh, underpins it. So, you know, to train a dog, to be, you know, to walk on a loose lead around other dogs that is either scared of them or obsessed with them is really, really tricky. And that's why we want to get that, that topic right and get that, you know, particularly if you have a puppy is balance it out. One of the things that we used to see a lot in people with um, staffies back in sort of the early 2000s when there was a couple of incidents with staffies in Sydney where they were getting a bit of a bad rap as potentially being aggressive dogs. And people would say, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to take him to the dog park every day. I want to socialise him. And then we'd end up with staffies that are over-social, too rough and too full-on with dogs, which, again, sort of starts to look a bit aggressive. Um, so it's about really finding that middle ground and knowing your dog and saying, well, you know, I have a German Shepherd, I have a Belgian Malinois, and they are notoriously assertive and strong and intimidating looking dogs. The chances of most dogs loving my Malinois are zero. He's a scary looking dog. So I teach him to try and be the better dog, to ignore other dogs. If they bark, to check in with me. If they give him a hard time, that his job is just, just to ignore them. Please ignore them. 99.9% .9 of the time, I want him to ignore other dogs. And that's because I know the breed is assertive, strong and scary, and other dogs are going to 
take offense just to his face. <laughs> you just got one of those heads that other dogs <laughs> want to punch in. So um, it's about understanding the dog and saying what level of socialization should I allow and should I expect and what kind of response is ideal from my dog. There are some dog groups that are more tolerant and more social, particularly our hounds, yeah. like, like our beagles, um, and, and the gun dogs as well, which are naturally more social and more tolerant, particularly of each other. But that doesn't mean a Kelpie uh, is going to enjoy the advances of a Labrador, a Golden Retriever or a, a Beagle. But, you know, you put a bunch of Beagles together, a bunch of Spaniels together, a bunch of Labradors together, they are going to be mm. pretty happy and pretty crazy. This is actually where dog parks can go wrong because yeah. you've got so many different breeds all vying for the same kind of uh, attention or, you know, having the same experience in a dog park where you've got the working dogs like the Kelpies and the cattle dogs that just want to be there with their owner, chasing their ball, and they actually don't care about the rest of the world. Or you've got the Kelpies that maybe it are trying to round up all the other dogs. Um, and then you've got the, you know, overzealous, crazy Labrador, a bit obnoxious that I can say that we've got one, um, that just wants to run up to every dog. So when you've got those two breeds meeting in the middle, it can sometimes not go well. And, you know, it, unfortunately it'll be the Kelpie that turns around and, um, and nips, nips, nips the lab and looks like the aggressor when really the Labrador probably shouldn't have run over to the Kelp to begin yeah. with. So anyway, we could we could go on about yeah, that. Yeah, but I should, just, I should just digress and say that oh. dog parks <laughs> or, or dog exercise areas can be good. And we've worked on the design of some and the unveiling of some. They can be good. And we know of a couple in New South Wales if the emphasis is on dog and yeah. owner exercise and engagement and obedience. Yeah. And that everyone, the community follows the rules. They're not just letting their dogs, their dogs aren't there to play with each other. Their dogs are there to do exercises with the owner in the presence of other dogs. There was that study done on 1800 dogs, I think it was, mm -hmm. in the dog park environment where they tested the cortisol of the dogs oh, yeah. before the saliva, before they entered the stress dog park, levels. stress levels, sorry, and 20 minutes later. And um, I can't a remember the stats, portion. but a huge portion of them actually weren't enjoying themselves yeah. at the park, even though the owners thought they were. So yeah. um, interesting, we should find that. And, um, yeah, add it to our page up. but yeah. yes we could go on forever and we st we are stereotyping a lot with dog breeds but it's yeah. because the majority of them do they fall do into fly. these categories yeah. we yeah. do have a, our sister-in-law that has a kelpie and it's a couch potato but you know nine out of ten kelpies are not going to be like that no, definitely not. <laughs> um yeah. so yes anyway obedience obedience training so, there is a couple of things that uh every dog in australia must learn First one is come when called, okay? We say that from the beginning. When we ask our dogs to come, we set them up for success and we make sure that every single time they come, it's Christmas and Disneyland all at once. Yeah. They get rewards, they get an emotional connection and they get the ability to oh, go yeah. free. Yeah. When we're training our dogs to come, we want them to think, I come. I get praised, I get rewarded, and I get to go back to doing whatever I was doing. Now, that last bit is so critical because usually when you want your dog to come, it's because there's a problem, right? And if your dog thinks every time I come, there's a problem and I never go back to investigating what I was chasing or what I was into before, uh, you have a dog that goes, I'm chasing, for example, a chicken. When mum asks me to come, I get a single piece of chicken and then I get clipped on lead, the dog will perform an equation. After a few repetitions, the dog will go, I have a whole chook, you have one piece, I'm going to stay with the whole chook. But if we practice games with our dogs where we say, come away from play with someone else and you'll get a treat and get to go back to play, the dog reliably thinks that when I'm asked to come, no matter what I'm chasing, I usually get to go back to it. I usually get to go back to the ball, back to my friend, back to another family member. So when you do ask the dog to come away from the chicken or the kangaroo, the dog goes, great, I'll come. I'll get a treat. And in a moment, you're probably going to let me to go back and chase the chook or chase the roo. When you don't let them chase it that one out of 10 times, providing you're practicing recalls lots of other times, your dog 
won't hold that against you. The dog will go, okay, one time I didn't get to go free. I still got a treat, but I still got praise. And usually I get to go free. So the message is practice getting your dog to come, practice rewarding it, practice praising it, and do it in an environment where you can let your dog go free after they've come. Which is generally not when back to chasing a chicken. No, don't do back to chicken. Come on, that should go to that side. No, because you just said it before um, uh, in that context. But no, yes. Yeah, you... practice it. Oh, we want you to practice it in locations where the dog isn't doing something wrong. So when you do need it. Yes, dog, you can actually you can. pull them away and, yeah. and protect them from or protect the chicken yeah. from your dog. Um, we'll do things like slowly build them up to being able to call them away from their dinner. For sure. Get a treat, go back to their dinner. Or yeah. someone, you know, Ryan might be playing with the puppy on the ground and then I say, come, and the puppy comes away, gets a treat, and then I encourage the puppy back to playing with Ryan on the ground. Absolutely. So they're the sorts of situations we're talking about with the come. But it, there is a hundred steps. Yeah. You know, you have not fully trained a bomb-proof recall until you are at step 100, which is potentially six months down the track. Yeah, for sure. We say your recall isn't perfect unless you can call your dog away from a whole barbecue chicken, from other dogs playing, from people playing with toys and uh, there's something else. Maybe all of that together. Or, yeah, well, all of that together. If your dog can't do all those things, you don't have a perfect recall. No. So you shouldn't be letting your dog off lead at the beach or um, off lead at a park if you think it's going to raid someone's picnic. People... All people have a right to be in every council parkland doing whatever they want. They are allowed to sit down on the ground at a park that happens to be an off-lead exercise area or a beach and have a picnic on the ground without your dog invading their space. And that, that is a fact. Your dog can be labelled a nuisance dog or a menacing dog if it charges into someone's picnic and causes chaos. So for your dog, um, Train it to recall away from food. Train it to recall away from social interactions. Let's say that the dog doesn't have a good recall and you're wanting to train a good recall. Then you can, again, use this pyramid to, to go back to basics again. So working out what well, genetics, if you've got a husky, it's going to take a lot longer than if you've got a... Um, why, why is that though? Explain why it's harder to train. train because to huskies husky. are trained to push on, to move away, to drive further. So they are, and I'd say beagles are probably. And beagles are the same, well, yeah, yeah. Are sure. some of the harder breeds to train a recall. So Not impossible, but they're just a bit harder. That's right. So, you know, if you've got a husky uh, and genetics will tell you, you're going to have a lot of. A lot more harder, um, a longer on. yeah time. Then management, put a long lead on the dog. If you're not sure, a hundred percent of the time that they are going to come when you call them, you want to add a long line to help you succeed. Because a lot, a long line is just a a dog <laughs> lead that might extend or not extend. Yeah, twenty so meters. At twenty meters of long of a lead, or a ten meter, or even a five meter lead that um, enables you to have the dog feel free and explore more, but be still connected to you or yep. you have you know, an extra bit of dog to grab. Because you might, dogs, we get, a, we get the question a lot. My dog's perfect at home, will recall all the time, but if I'm at a dog park or if I'm out and about, it goes out the window. And that's because you've stepped from level one to level 100 um, in one go. So having a long line helps with that. So anyway, obedience. The other, yep. the other most important? Uh, is, is stay, okay? So so we teach our dogs to sit and stay as usually sort of step one of training is sit, implied, sit. implied sit and stay. So yep. if in doubt, we want our dogs to always sit and stay. When you get to a door, probably a good idea to sit and stay. When you get to a gate, it's probably a good idea to sit and stay unless you're invited out or invited in. When you get to the edge of a road, stop, sit and stay and await further instruction. So that we just, it's just repetitions. It's just, it's just building it into the dog. And we honestly, we don't say a lot. We have the door, the gate or the road be the cue or be the command. When you get to the front door, I'm gonna make you sit and stay for a moment until I say free or come or outside. And the dogs just learn that in these locations, they're very good contextual learners. In these locations, I'm usually going to be made to sit and stop for a moment. So just offer it up autonomously. I think an important thing to realise um, at this point in the pyramid and with the sit is that 
dogs perceive far more than just the treat in your hand as being reinforcing. So it might be going outside is what makes them feel good. So if they're jumping up on the door before you open it, you have um, you trained them to jump to go outdoors, you know? So think of all the things that your dog might perceive as being reinforcing or rewarding uh, and um, make sure that the awful paws are on the ground prior to that happening. Yeah. It might be meeting, meeting, other people, people. Yeah. meeting people yeah. um i can't think i've lost everything yeah. coming out of car going if you know um it's freedom but, yeah freedom yeah as well as treats as well as praise and cuddles and affection yeah so the uh and then the final most obvious thing which um you know we're not even going to tell you how <laughs> to do it because this is something where we would really encourage you to seek out a local dog trainer or a dog club uh, particularly those of you in cairns you've got some really good dog clubs around there and that is uh, walking on lead. Yeah. Okay. It is something. There's an entire chapter on this. Yeah. Yeah. One it's whole chapter. So complex. Just for that. And even in that, we say, you know, you should probably still seek out a good dog trainer to help you with loose lead walking. But at the end of the day, if you have a dog that walks on a nice loose lead that comes when cold and can stay, that's pretty much the dream. For most pet dog owners that have a difficult dog, they would just want those three things and they'd be really, really happy with their dog. So if you just chip away at that, those three things with your dog and maybe, you know, get the book or engage with an, a local dog trainer. Um, you'd be amazed at how far you can go just looking at those three obedience exercises on their own. Yeah. We've, we cover about, I don't know, eight to 10 different things to train your dogs from shake and scent yep. detection and all sorts of other things. I guess that comes into outlets um, as well. And it's great to continue your training, training journey, but master those basics first. Yep. Um, okay, because yeah, we're running yeah. out of time, yeah, well, outlets is probably, I think, one of the most important things in completing the pyramid. Yeah. And this is your absolute... Well, um, it's it's my favourite topic. now. Me too I, in puppy school now, actually. Yeah. It's become a much bigger part of our puppy school because I think it, it develops a really strong bond with you as the owner. It develops um, an outlet for the dog, depending on what their genetics are. Let's explain what outlets are. Oh. Out, outlets <laughs> are, are just exercises and activities that you choose <laughs> and you enable your dog to do based upon their personality and their genetics that just make them feel good. That's all it is. It's just things that make them feel good. Jen and I, as humans, have different activities that we do and we acknowledge that we need to do on a regular basis to feel normal and to function and to be better at work. So for me, I've got to get in the ocean two, three times a week. I have to, otherwise I don't work well. He's I'm not, cranky to live I'm, Yeah, well, I'm not productive. <laughs> Jen needs to get out in the garden and just, you know, plant trees, prune, water, rake. And Jen just likes being in amongst nature and connecting with nature a couple of times a week or if not every day, just for a little bit, just to, to decompress. So dogs need the same. Dogs need the same. They yeah. need to sniff. They need to run. They might need to swim. They need play to problem fetch, solve. Use their brain. Yeah. Some people love to play chess and do Sudoku. If you have a border collie, think of that as a dog that likes to do Sudoku while running marathons, right? They they have every dog has things that make them feel good. That would be a crime not to let them practice. So again, in the book, we have a whole chapter on outlets, on things you can do with your dog to make them feel good. But we would suggest that everyone should, with every single dog at some stage, get them to use their nose. It's how they see the world. Get them to find their treats, find a ball, find you, find the kids, find you money, find you drugs, uh, whatever you want them to do. Don't get them to find drugs unless you're a police officer. Um, but get your dog to use their nose in some way, shape or form is the best, most underrated outlet that you can do. The easiest one is just scatter feeding their food in the backyard or putting their food in the Kong and they have, you know, all that little stuff helps towards um, the food. But outlets is, I mean, people think when they've got a puppy, with a dog, sorry, the two main forms of exercise I reckon would be uh, running free to dog park or ball chucker, yeah. ball, constant back and forth um, fetch. And both of those don't actually um, allow that dog to use its brain as well. So a lot of the outlets that we're going to talk about very quickly because yeah. we're running out of time and questions are coming in um, is about combining the two. Yeah, yeah. Um, using the brain and, and using some sort of 
impulse control yeah. combined with a physical activity. It's not That's a right. mindless just running task. It's a task with purpose and with some rules and maybe an end goal. That just make that dog feel incredibly satisfied by the end yeah. of the day. So that all those things together lead to the tip of the pyramid, which, which is a happy dog. Now, we've got a couple of questions coming through that we're going to hit. And if you have any, you know, you can punch them in now and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, the, the first one uh, that we're seeing here now uh, from Helen is about um, how to keep other dogs away from her sausage dog uh, when she's at the beach. She keeps her on lead, but other people with other dogs think she's cute. Um, and she ends up, you know, it ends up being a stressful environment. Look, there's a couple of things you can do, Helen. If it's an off lead, if it's an area where dogs are permitted to be off lead, I would honestly just say, don't take your dog there, unfortunately. Um, if your dog is finding it stressful and you know that there's going to be other off lead dogs there, it's not the right thing to do. If it is an on lead area, um, what I do, if I'm walking or working with a dog that is fearful or reactive, um, there's two things that I usually do. And, and I have... Um, some big great Danes that were super aggressive I was working with for a while. Whenever I walked with those dogs, I must have had a look on my face that said, don't talk to me, right? Because um, I would rarely get people come up and try and engage with me or these dogs. They were beautiful looking dogs, but were aggressive. No, no, people love Danes. <laughs> they want to come and pat them. But I would also, if someone approached, I'd put my hand up, show them and say, stop, don't approach the dog. Get your dog under control, do not approach, and I'd keep walking. Advocate. Advocate. I advocate for the dog. I don't make excuses. I don't say he's not friendly, she's not friendly, because they go, it's okay, my dog's friendly. Or I don't say he doesn't like people, it's okay, I'm great with dogs. I do not give the other people an opportunity to debate or discuss the topic with yeah. me. It's unfortunately, you have to be a little bit rude, but I would say stop, do not approach. Get your dog under control, do not approach, and I would move on. The other thing yeah. I do, though, I take a slip lead with me everywhere I go. That is a small lead that can open up in a, in a noose. And if I get an off lead dog in an area where a dog is meant to be on lead, particularly if I'm working with someone else's dog, I'll catch the off lead dog. That's not something a lot of people would feel comfortable doing, but it is. It is it's something I do because I'm, yeah. I'm often handling aggressive dogs. And for the safety of the off lead dog, if I catch it, it is less likely to be bitten by the sausage dog or by the Dane or by whatever it is that I have. So I do it out of courtesy and safety for the oncoming dog just to catch it and to have it under control. And then maybe I can look at the collar and call the person. It happened, honestly, I catch off lead dogs all the time and I take them home to the owners. Mistakes happen. People don't mean to have those dogs approaching me, but usually I can loop my lead of the dog that I'm walking around something secure and then I can catch the off-lead dog, check the mobile phone number and call the owner and say, hey, I've caught your dog. The other thing that you can do is there's uh, is company friendly dog collars. Friendly oh, yes. Dog. Yeah, it's yeah. Friendly dog collars, which have all different um, leads, all different colors. Yellow is generally the color for a timid or nervous puppy yep. or dog. And it has nervous stay, you know, stay away or give room or something yeah, yeah. like that. And you can also now buy t shirts yeah. that say, keep back my dog's. Yeah, 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 aggressive or yeah, get back or my dog's my learning dog. or something, you know. Yeah. So there's lots of different things out there that that you can do. Um, hope that helps, Helen. It's a it's a difficult one and it's frustrating when you're doing the right thing. Um, we're about to get a puppy in a few weeks. Thinking of crate training, however, our two older rescue dogs just sleep in our bedroom with us. What can one of you, what? Sorry, what would your suggestions for the puppy be? If you've got two rooms, I'd suggest if there's two of you. I think it sounds like there's two of you, maybe not. Well, no, there's two. So this is from Ashley. So she's got two older rescue dogs that sleep in the bedroom and a new puppy. Yes, but I'm saying if there's two humans in the household, which I believe we are about to get a puppy. Anyway, if there's two of you, I'd suggest one of you sleep in a spare room if you have one that's or on we, the lounge. That's what we do. Mm, yeah. Usually. <laughs> With them, no, oh, when we get a new puppy, well, it's because they're kids. <laughs> but when we get a puppy, usually, yeah. One of us will sleep in a spare room or in the lounge room with yep. the puppy with Help. the crate training. And That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, uh, and if you've got two dogs that already have a particular routine sleep in your room, then you don't have to upset them and introduce the puppy. So I would be dividing and conquering yeah. in that particular. I mean, instance. and actually as well, you <laughs> can gradually start to introduce crate training for the adult dogs as well. And there's no reason why you can't have dogs crated in your bedroom. We, um, our old Aussie Shepherd used to 
he was raised crate trained and then as he became an obedient adult dog we just never did it and he slept wherever he wanted um but then when we had our first child come home um he got stepped on by accident at night in the bedroom as we we're tending to the crying baby he got a bit stressed when the baby would cry and he'd try and follow us around as we we're soothing the bub and the dog didn't have a good time so at I don't know, the dog was probably four or something at that age. We, we reintroduced the crate. the crate and just started, you know, it only took him a day or two. But and he was so much happier, happier. and that, that association or that connection to Lennox being, you know, every time he would cry during the day, Ari would, prior to crating, would be whimpering and carrying on. As soon as we crated him and that, that problem at night stopped, he was much happier. Yeah, so, so don't, don't, um, don't think it is a bad thing for your adult dogs. We really view the crate as something that's comfortable, that is den-like and is a, an environment Calm. where the dog associates it with being calm. Yeah. Jen created a beautiful analogy where our bedrooms for humans are associated with being calm and going to sleep. And that helps program our brain to go there and to be calm and to fall into a deeper slumber more quickly. We can do the same with the dogs in their crates, make it comfortable, associate it with sleep, and your dog can actually get better sleep. Yeah. Which they need. Yes. Um, so what is the best way to stop puppy nipping and biting the kids? Uh, look, this is one we can absolutely talk about because we've got two one-year-olds, a six-year-old and a 10-week-old puppy. Uh, and the best way is management. <laughs> it's that annoying thing where we always come back to man management. But we've got a puppy pen in the house. We've got a crate in the house. We've got a puppy pen outside the house, um, a crate outside the house. So, and we spend the first few weeks of that puppy's life working almost solely on developing an independence and happiness in that puppy being in those spaces. So when the nipping and biting starts and becomes worse, we can comfortably and confidently pop them in these spaces with a bit of enrichment and they're not going to cry the house down. So if you haven't done that and the biting's already started, just try to work a little bit on the crating and the puppy pens as being a great place, not just when they go feral yeah um and, and if you've got children of an age that they can participate in training um like our six-year-old can getting that child to do exercise with the dog like the sit and stare or sit and stay creates an association from the puppy to the child as um, a source of information <laughs> and something that they should sit and look at instead of chase and round up so getting kids involved in training the dogs um, under control with, with treats and with the guidance and supervision of an adult can really help prevent um, the puppy viewing the child as another, you know, yeah. playmate or a chew toy or anything like that. Yeah, we get our kids too, so they are involved in the puppy without actually being um, becoming nervous because it's biting. Is to create enrichment and give it to the puppy, or do do a scav hunt in the backyard by hiding all the puppy's food. You know, there's ways of engaging kids and puppies without it having to be a free for all because that never ends well. Yeah. Um, uh, how do I get, I hope we've got yep. just enough question for one more. How do I get my dog and cat to get along? Yeah, um, I, I think there's a two-pronged approach to this. The first one is, again, management, but preventing the dog from being able to chase the cat yeah. or, or terrorise the cat. But the other one is looking at the cat as an individual and trying to make the cat be very confident in the presence of the dog. So what I usually suggest to clients is that we might have the dog in a crate or on a tie-up exercise or in a location where the dog is calmer and more relaxed. And then we bring the cat into the room or try and lure the cat into the room or in the same space or somewhere where the dog and the cat can see each other and give the cat really, really high value food items. Now, cats are you know supreme carnivores, so I'm not just gonna give them a little bit of dry food. I'm gonna give the cat that something amazing that makes the cat strut around and appear confident and less interesting to the dog or not skittish around the dog. So I'll give the cat, cat crab meat, sardines, fresh roast chicken, anything that's going to be really delicious and, and have the cat focused on eating and, you know, moving around the room as a confident animal, not something that a dog want to chase. So dogs will chase cats that are skittish and nervy. The super confident cat that struts around um, really limits the dog's predatory response and creates a different association from the cat being something fun to chase to the cat just being another 
living being in the environment that is confident. That's neutral. That neutral. whole back to the socialization thing yeah. is just rather than trying to forge a relationship um, that ends up being, you know, maybe what you've found yourself in the situation of now is just trying to make the cat boring, don't worry about it. And then they, the naturally that relationship forms over time. So yep. awesome. I think that's it. That's brought us to 12, th uh, 1 30. I hope you enjoyed. Go out and buy our book, uh, especially because we didn't go into the outlets at all. Um, right. And this, well, not really. <laughs> um, and this explains them all in here. Uh, and all the best with your dogs. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, you can get us at www.tapeanimals.com. Um, there's short courses and other things you can find on there about us and about how we train dogs. That's right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.